Hello, and thank you for joining us. Over the next several weeks, we're starting a new series leading up to Easter. We're calling it Dark to Light. Now, when you begin to think about that, you begin to think of transformation where darkness is just the absence of light, correct? And so we want to go on this journey together to look at how Jesus was there, about how he is our redemption, he's our hope. And so Jesus is able to take all our hurts, our abandonments, our loneliness. He redeems all things together. And even more so, Jesus makes us significant just by his presence. And so we know that a typical Easter series would go through all the, the last final moments of Jesus, while often we count down to that final, final hour. What we see is we would normally typically see Jesus saying farewell to his disciples. The betrayal, he's beaten, and darkness falls on the world. And then we celebrate the resurrection. This year we want to do something just a little different. I feel like we've all had enough darkness, pain, and frustration. So let's look at the hope that came from the resurrection and work our way back to that event, Jesus in the empty tomb. We need to be reminded that even if what seems insignificant, what seems simple, minor, Jesus is there working to bring life. So today we want to look at a story of two people. While that may seem so insignificant, it may seem like it's even unrelevant because there aren't mentioned that heavily throughout Scripture. Take note what Jesus is doing through their story. Jesus takes normal life, normal tasks, and transforms it into something incredible. See, before all of this COVID stuff, where we, that our nation got shut down, and we, we no longer ate in restaurants and stuff, I really enjoyed eating at Cracker Barrel. And what's interesting about when you eat at Cracker Barrel, one, they're everywhere, but two, when you go in, they're all the same. When you sit down on the table, they have that little peg game, that little triangle with the pegs, right? For you can sit there and you can play and just pass the time while you wait for your food. For many, it's just a game. For many, it's just a delicacy that you're like, yeah, I know what you're talking about. But I got my love for those little things like those and for Rubik's Cubes for my grandma, who was a math teacher. She loved all of those puzzles, and she would spend time finding the, the formula from each hole to be able to solve that puzzle. And so those little games are significant to me. It might not be to you, but to me it is. And that's one thing we understand is we all have those little things that seem insignificant, but they bring great value to us. We can tell and find what people value to be significant by what they hang on their walls, what they like, and what their possessions are. And there you begin to discover their passions. This has nothing to do with the sermon, but just a plug for all those introverts like me out there. This is free. When you get to a place and you have no clue what to have a conversation about, look around, look at their walls, look at their collectibles, and you're able to find points of conversation to talk about. If it's worth displaying to the world, they're proud of it. So maybe it's a picture, a trophy, a trinket. Once again, in the grand scheme of this thing, all the world, it may seem small, and it may not seem like it means a lot to others, but it means something to you, and it's why it's important. So in Luke chapter 24, we find Jesus as is the resurrection, and he has 40 days now to get the word out. He has all of hell trembling, but now he wants to show the world that he is the son of the living God. Let me prove it to you. And he can redeem them, that the grave could not keep him, and one day, as Jesus defeats death. So what does he do next day? What does he do day one as it says in the scripture? Well, what do we expect Jesus to do? See, the best way to get the message out for you and I would to be to proclaim it from a high place. Let me scream and shout so everyone can hear it. But think about it this way. If you were in a typical room, if you were in our sanctuary with us, and normally, yeah, you would say, yeah, he would preach from up there on stage. But how different would it be if I would come down to you? One, you're like, well, that made me awkward. That was different. That's not what I expected. See, that's what takes place, that you would expect him to be proclaiming it from the high place. But yet Jesus comes down to them. He comes down 
to their place. We find Jesus on this road to this distant place, to these people we all know very little about. See, the story in that context sounds so insignificant. But yet, Jesus brings value to that. In our minds, we would say it would be so much easier for him to stay in Jerusalem, to proclaim there, to get the word out that way. So we believe Jesus would have been on this road to Emmaus. Emmaus was a small place where scholars still dispute over the actual location. It doesn't sound like a place everyone like Jesus would have gone. So why after defeating death, why would this be the place where Jesus would go? This such simple place. If you remember, Jesus does so much of his work in insignificant people and places. And that's what we want to take notice of. Would we begin to look for Jesus in the insignificant places of life? What Jesus does, he takes what seems like nothing, and he redeems it, and he brings hope and life, purpose, rooted in the relationship we have in him. So there's four parts that we begin to discover throughout this, this passage here. Let's take note of the interaction at the beginning here between Jesus and Cleophas. So in Luke chapter 24, starting in verse 13, it says, Now, that same day, two of them were going to the village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, What are you so discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleophas asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. So in the first part we begin to see in this walk, they were on. We don't know much about them. We don't know about much about Emmaus. But we do know about Jesus. We're given the name of one, Cleophas, and we're not sure the other person, whether it's his wife or brother or friend. So there they are walking down the road back to Emmaus from Jerusalem. See, their identity doesn't matter much because the story is not about them. It's about Jesus. And we get to share learning about Jesus just like they did. So these two have been following Jesus. They declare themselves as disciples. Now they didn't say how long they've been doing this. But they believed that he was going to be the one to redeem them, to save them. He had been the one who was going to overthrow Rome to to help alleviate the persecution that they were under. He was going to bring freedom. So imagine all that they witnessed that just took place when the one they thought was going to bring life was put into the grave. It was a dark couple days for them. They were broken. They didn't know what to do anymore. So we find Cleophas, and then going back to what was familiar to them. Has life ever hit you so hard that you just go back to what is familiar to you? When we experience deep, painful hurt, we begin to question ourselves. Nothing has turned out the way we expected, and yet here they are on this road. This random person comes up and starts talking to them. So one thing we know that Jesus was not like He was when he first started his journey. Life's not easy. Life is not without disappointments. Jesus disappoints the Jews in the Bible when they were not happy, when they found out who he was. The young ruler who came to Jesus and asked what he needed to do, Jesus told him to sell all your possessions, sell your stuff and follow me. He walked away sorrowfully. The disciples would ask questions about the kingdom and Jesus would respond in parables to leave them confused and frustrated and questioning. So this frustration comes from the gap. That gap is, a, is part of our expectations and what we truly experience. Each one of us, just like these people, came to him with an expectation of what Christ didn't meet. How do we fill the gap of expectation and experience? It's easy to fill with frustration. It's easy to fill with anger. It's easy to fill with debauchery. What are you filling the gap with in your life? what we expect, and what we experience. See, if Jesus would just come and have met all of those expectations, he would never have had to learn how to trust. So Cleophas is in that gap right now of what he expected and what he just experienced. 
See, we know he rose from the grave. We know that our minds will be restored. We know how he is going to take the dark, insignificant moments of this normal, just plain Sunday and make it the most famous Sunday ever. We know what they do not know. So no wonder why they felt left down. Do we blame them? Jesus portrayed himself pretty insignificantly. He rode into town on a donkey. He was born in a manger. He took the role of a carpenter. So our role, our part, church, is to not let our unmet expectations of our life get in the way of what God is trying to do in your life. When do we exchange our minds, and even in the darkest, strangest times of our life, do we not expect Him to show up? Do we not expect God to show up even when things don't go the way we expected? And that's part two. Jesus shows up. To repeat a little bit of the last one, just to give us some context, starting in verse 17, he asked them, What are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleophas and asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked about Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. It was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all of the people, the chief priests and all the rulers, handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find his body. They came and told us that he had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and they found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, How foolish you are, and how slow to believe all the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? In the beginning with Moses of all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. So in the first part, we take note of what was really going on. Jesus, they don't know if it's him. For us, we must remember, we, we know. We know the other side of the story, but they didn't. And so here they go for it. He says, Jesus, the name above all names, by means of all creation. Jesus, the most powerful, the son of the living God. When word was made flesh, Jesus, the one who created Clevis, the one who gave him breath in his lungs to speak, the one who gave him purpose of life to walk. That Jesus comes up to them and says, so what are you talking about? I mean, while the irony of all of that just takes place, and while they didn't find it funny at all, they were broken to pieces. And they stood still and downcast. Cliff is probably just being polite, even though he's broken inside, as he keeps his conversation going with this man. But more so confused on how did this man miss out? How did he not know the grasp, the severity of what was going on? How did he miss it? So there Cleophas is talking to the one, the creator, the all-powerful, the all-knowing, the son of God, right there as he asks, you don't know about him? So Cleophas starts his response. He says he was a prophet. He was powerful word and deed. There are several things going on in the very moment that makes this captivating. While he allows Cleophas to keep speaking, telling Jesus all about what had happened, while he was the one that had happened too. He was standing right there. What is strange is this, that Jesus is the, describes countless times throughout Scripture as the I Am. But Cleophas was thinking and talking, and he kept referencing Jesus as He was. Take note of the difference. Jesus went from the I Am to the He Was. He is no longer the Son of the living God. He was. And here's the thing, Cleophas. No, 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 you're missing it. See, when we get to that gap, to that dark place, even when someone comes to try to encourage us to bring us out of that place, sometimes we just can't see it. Jesus was in his midst. He was in his presence he was the hope of the world. And yet here he is. Right there in front of him. Within his reach. 
He had the ability to reach out and touch him. You know, something that we're not allowed to do because of social distancing and COVID. So to imagine, he wasn't like he was just in a social distance range, but he was right there where they, he could have reached out and said, Lord, Master, gave him a hug. But verse 21 says, But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all of this took place. See, David had written back in Psalm 42 that he was in a dark place. He didn't sense God. He hoped that God would have come through. And yet he kept on praising the Lord. It says, Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise Him, my Savior and my God. See, David is telling them to put their hope in God. Everything might turn out the way that you expect. Cleus is feeling that. You sense the defeat in his voice. They were so focused on their expectation. They almost missed out on Jesus being the Messiah. And what that really meant for them. See, their hope was in a grave. And there what we realize is this. As they were walking away, they might have missed it. They were going back home. They were going back to familiar. They were so upset. And so while their hope of the world was in that grave, when the grave was in, they're like, where's he at? They could have missed it. And this is what's spectacular. While they might have missed it, while we might have missed it, Jesus didn't miss them. He doesn't miss us. Jesus was not done with them, and he met them right where they are, where you are. Watch Jesus show up in the most insignificant areas of your life. In the deepest pain, he was there. And when their hope was gone, when their hope was unfamiliar. See, we can have hope today because grace chases us down. We might miss it, but he will come after us. See, for Cliff, something significant was about to happen. And yet it started small, and it started in the midst of a question. When Jesus responds, what are you talking about? See, Jesus was there, and they didn't realize it. And he is there with us also. But so often we don't realize it. We don't see it. We don't sense it. So Jesus goes on to explain about how they wrote about it. Back when it all happened, he explains, says, look at the events that took place. Look at all the scriptures that were pointing towards me being there. So the longer they walked and the longer they talked, the, the, the deeper the conversation had to get. The deeper the relationship would have built. That's powerful for us because right there, we realize, while he might meet us there, Jesus won't leave us there. He's going to keep pulling us along. He wants to bring us with him. So in verse 28, it says, As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continues on as if they were going farther. But they urged him strongly, Stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So we went to stay with him. When he was at the table with them, he took bread and gave thanks, broke it and began to give it to them. Their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, Were not our hearts burning within so while we were talking with us on the road and opening the scriptures to us? See, this morning, they woke up not expecting to receive this invitation. But rather, they woke up this morning the loss of the Savior. They weren't expecting to receive this invitation, but they were receiving grief and sorrow. So when they arrived in Emmaus, Cleophas just can't let go. They get to the end of the road, and yet he says, there's more to this. Don't leave us. There's something powerful about his presence that drew him in. Is everything they were longing for in their hurt. This is a powerful lesson for us about letting Jesus in. See, it's, we can let Jesus in, but the relationship takes work. When we ask Jesus into our life, into our home, it takes place here is physically. He comes and then they sit and just breaks bread. Traditionally, this would have been the, ho the host's job. They would have done it. What a beautiful illustration of surrender. When we allow Jesus to come into our lives, 
He began to take over things and processes. It tells us that everything we do, there's something more to it. So when we let Jesus in, it changes everything. Before the little things, we now see them as big things. That Jesus is with us. So for Clavis, the reality of just only made sense at the end. Everything along the way all came together at that moment. Their eyes were open and they realized that he was the one all along. Their hope, their joy, their peace was right there. They just didn't realize it. I think for Clavis, it was the invita- when he invited Jesus in. That's when he found clarity. The same takes place for us when we let Jesus in. When we give him that invitation. Each week we spend time having a time of invitation. And maybe this week's invitation goes the other way. Normally we say, hey, would you receive this? Would you take part in this call? The tugging of your heart. But maybe the invitation goes the other way. Christ is waiting to come be part of your life. Will you open that door? Will you welcome him? Will you let him be the host of your life? Would you invite him in? Give him the invitation. And then finally, we see in verse 33, they got up and they returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It is true, the Lord has risen and he has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what they had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. The response was simple when they let him in. They couldn't keep him there. They had to go tell about it. There's a time for everything. We understand that there's a time for mourning and a time for healing. But may we see not about what has been done to us, but rather what God wants to bring through us. God is seeking to be part of our lives. And in a world of darkness and pain and frustration, it's easy to look and see, man, there's so much going on. But would we welcome him in? Would we give him the invitation to say, Lord, would you come in? Would you take over all my processes? Would you break the bread? I want to surrender to you. Would you give God that invitation today to be Lord of your life? Yes, I will lift you high.